come back for lunch. And now we continue with Vicky's lecture. Please. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so before I was talking to you about semi-definite programming, and now I'm going to talk to you about Gleason's theorem, which is almost completely unrelated. So uh, <laughs> try to just clear your minds. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so. Uh, is this a good size nod or shake nod? Yes, okay, sort of visible. Okay, um, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna talk to you about uh, Gleason's theorem and Often when I'm speaking to people, I'm like, ah, so do you know what Gleason's theorem is? And they're like, ah, oh, yeah, like kind of, and I've heard of it. So hopefully, like, uh, I'll just be able to tell you what it is, and then you'll be able to like be like, ah, oh, yes, I do know like what the point of Gleason's theorem is, uh, and you can take this into your lives and enjoy it. Um, so, so Gleason's theorem, uh, as the name suggests, uh, it's a mathematical theorem and it's about Hilbert space, but then because it's about Hilbert space, uh, it can tell us some things about quantum theory. Um, and so then I'm gonna present it from one point of view, but there are kind of different consequences that you can see about quantum theory from Gleason's theorem. Uh, and the point of view I'm gonna start from is um, the objective of deriving quantum theory from some axioms, okay? So this is kind of a, a direction that has been around for many years, like sort of since quantum theory uh, was first sort of developed, um, because currently it's kind of postulated in a very abstract mathematical way, and people are always uh, searching for some maybe more intuitive or more physical, less abstract axioms that you can use. And Gleason's theorem was like, probably the first step in this direction and was like very important. So um, I'll try and explain this to you. So we'll start with some maybe standard postulation of uh, quantum theory in this abstract way and then see what Gleason's theorem can tell us. So I'm gonna have my first postulate, which I'll call H for Hilbert. Um, and so in the notes that I've sent you, things are written more completely and fully and I'm gonna kind of make a bit briefer uh, explanation on the board. So I'm gonna just write this one as um, a quantum system uh, can be associated to a uh, separable Hilbert space. So I think this will be something that you're kind of used to. So for each quantum system, uh, there's kind of a relevant Hilbert space that we consider. Uh, and then the second one, I'll call S for state. Um, and it's gonna be that for every uh, state of our system, oh, I'm gonna call my Hilbert space H. So this is like calligraphic H. Uh, so for every state of the system, uh, there is a density operator rho on H. Um, I'm not going to do them all, by the way. Hello. What's a separable Hilbert space? Uh, so a separable Hilbert space just means that it has a countable orthonormal basis. So the ones that you're used to using, so like C to the D for any D, those are all separable Hilbert spaces. And then uh, which, whichever is your favorite implementation of the infinite dimensional uh, Hilbert space. Um, so maybe like L2 of R. So uh, for, for each dimension, they're all isomorphic to each other. Uh, so you can just think about one if you want. And you can always just think about this basis, which I guess in the infinite case would be like the Fock basis. Is that helpful? Yeah, okay. Oh, John told me there's no eraser and he was correct. I guess we'll just leave that there. Um, okay, yes. So for every state, uh, there is a density operator, uh, operator rho on H, uh, and then I'll have M, 
which is so uh, so for each measurement so I'm just going to think about discrete measurements that have a discrete number of outcomes um, there uh, exists uh, this a sequence of mutually orthogonal projections, uh, pi, on the Hilbert space. Uh, so this is like a projective measurement. Hopefully you're familiar with this. And then like each outcome of the measurement is associated like to one of these projections, pi, in the sequence. Um, so if you're more used to like POVMs, um, so for the minute I'm not considering POVMs, I'm just thinking about projective measurements. Uh, and this is kind of the the subset of POVMs where each one of the effects uh, squares to itself. Um, okay, and then the final one I'm going to write down for you. Ooh, fancy. Uh, I'm going to call B for the Born rule. Uh, and I'm just going to summarize this as the probability um, that you see the outcome associated with pi j, given that your system is in state rho, is given by the trace of uh, pi j rho for the Born rule. Um, and then there are some more postulates that talk about like dynamics and composition of systems, but those aren't really relevant for what we're doing today, so I'll just put dot, dot, dot. Um, okay, so these are pretty abstract. We just have kind of physical thing that we kind of think about and understand is described by mathematical object. Doesn't really give us a lot of insight. Um, so then the question that we're going to ask is, uh, given this postulate about how to represent a measurement, what kind of states could there possibly be? Right, like what kind of limitations does this place on the states that we could have in our theory? So we're not going to assume that they're density operators. We're just going to try and think about what the definition of a, a state would be for us. Okay, um, so uh, so I'll ask, uh, what is a State. Um, so what should a state do in your theory and like the most basic thing it should do is uh, it should tell you if you do some experiment or make some ob observations what are the probabilities of making those certain observations or seeing certain outcomes of your experiment right this is what the this is like the job of the state in your theory um, and maybe one way to think about that is if, uh, if you can prepare your system in two different ways, but no matter what measurement or observation you make, you get the same uh, probabilities from these measurements and observations, you can't really distinguish in some sense the state of this system. So this uh, is the idea of uh, operational equivalence, I guess, that uh, David was talking about. So we're going to look at kind of the equivalence, we're going to call a state like the equivalence class of things that we can distinguish, like preparations that we can distinguish. Um, so then, um, what, so what does this mean for us? So if we're assuming this uh, postulate M, um, we're going to say that this implies that a state should be a map that we'll call mu from the so this uh, so this set that I call uh, P of H is just going to be the the set of all of these projections on the Hilbert space. So this is kind of like a, a subset of P of H. So that's just how uh, I'll denote those. So then our state wants to give us a probability for each one of these different outcomes. So it's a map from the place where the outcomes live um, to 0, 1, like the interval 0, 1. So it tells us the probability of each one of these different outcomes. So 
when I say that M implies this, I'm kind of assuming what you might call like a non-contextuality uh, assumption in that if uh, this pi appears in multiple different measurements, the reason we're representing it by the same projection is because it's indistinguishable from the other outcome of the other measurement that it's in. So you can think of that as non-contextuality if you want, um, or just like, why would we represent two things by the same object if they were different? Um, okay, so that's what I'm including in M. So then that's why this map is well-defined and uh, we don't have to think for one projection, it might get uh, mapped to do different probabilities depending on which measurement it's in. Um, okay, and so then uh, because these are uh, uh, disjoint outcomes of the same measurement. We want the probabilities that we assign to them to sum to one, right? Um, so then this gives us that uh, mu of pi one plus mu of pi two plus dot 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 equals one uh, for any, so I'm just gonna say for all PVMs, so PVM for projection valued measure, but I just mean any of these sequences of mutually orthogonal projections. Uh, okay, so maybe this is a most fundamental concept to remember, so go through it once more. So the state assigns probabilities to the, all the different outcomes of the measurements and it does that. So if we have all the different disjoint outcomes of a possible measurement, then we want the probabilities of those to sum up to one because of probability. Okay, um, so this uh, is our setup uh, and now we're ready to learn what Gleason's theorem tells us. So Gleason's theorem tells us that um, so if the dimension of our Hilbert space is at least three, then any of these maps mu, you can write that as the trace of pi with some density operator rho. So, uh, and this is for all pi. So what we found is for every one of these things that we wanted to think of as a state, there is a density operator. Uh, and then to find the probabilities of the measurements, we use the Born rule. Uh, so we've essentially got back these two postulates, but instead of just kind of saying them out of the blue, uh, we kind of came up with a reason uh, why uh, of what a state should be, and uh, we kind of rederived them. Um, so there was some disappointment that I was doing a blackboard talk now, so there wouldn't be any more memes. So you have to kind of imagine the memes for yourself now, and I'm thinking of like, do you know like the little boy and he's really happy and he has like the little fist and he's like, yeah, like. <laughs> so this is the meme for this part. Um, <laughs> oh man, this is gonna be on YouTube as well. <laughs> it's embarrassing. <laughs> um, okay, okay, good, Gleason's theorem. So uh, yeah, so what I'm saying is that the consequence is that instead of, uh, so before where we had to have H, S, what the M, uh, and B uh, as our postulates to arrive at kind of this place, uh, now we can just have instead um, H, M and then plus, I'll just put state. So plus a kind of idea of what a state should be, which is 
less like a kind of random postulate out of nowhere and more like a, a reasoning for uh, what we mean by the definition of a state. Okay, so super good. Um, what was my next point? Oh yeah. Uh, so you may have become very concerned by, by this part and it is very concerning. I agree with you. Uh, so um, maybe some of your favorite Hilbert spaces are two-dimensional uh, and you, I don't know, maybe you're not quantum info people, but uh, the kind of people I see all the time work with qubits a lot, so then this could be very upsetting for them, right? So this doesn't apply uh, if your Hilbert space uh, is two-dimensional. So um, in dimension two, we can't do this substitution. So then for like, if you want to consider quantum theory as a whole in every dimension, then we can't exactly just remove uh, these two postulates and replace them by this definition of a state. Um, so now you have to think of your favorite sad meme uh, and add that. Um, okay. Um, so I'm going to write, uh, so unless uh, the dimension h equals 2. Uh, so it's kind of easy if you think about it to see, uh, hello. Yeah, I was just wondering, is there any particular reason for it to not work for dimension 3? That's what I'm going to do now. <laughs> that is a very good uh, forward thinking question. Uh, yeah, so unless for dimension two, why does it not work for dimension two? Um, so so the, um, the domain of our map mu in dimension two, so it's, the, so it's these projections and then our Hilbert space is C2. Uh, and this looks like, so what's in this set? Ooh, yes, uh, so we have the identity is, uh, a, uh, is a projection uh, on C2, uh, the zero is a projection on C2, and then we have all the rank one projections, um, which, are, which you can represent like this. Hopefully you know what this is. Uh, so it's like, so every, what you're used to as a quantum state, uh, it like spans a 1D uh, subspace of the Hilbert space, and then we write the projection onto that uh, subspace uh, with this notation. Um, so these are what our projections look like. So then what do our constraints on M, uh, on mu look like now? So um, we have, Mu of i equals one. Uh, mu of zero equals zero. And mu of, oh, this should go up. And mu of uh, some protection plus mu of the orthogonal projection to it. equals one. So to visualize these projections better, um, you can just think about the block ball or the block sphere actually. Uh, um, and then each one of these rank one projections are just a point on the block sphere. Uh, so if this the projection onto psi, then the, the opposite point or the on antipodal point on the sphere is the orthogonal projection. Okay, so our map mu is like basically uh, it maps every point on the sphere to, um, to a probability and the, the points that you, the 
the numbers that you map a pair of opposite points to have to sum to one, and that's our only constraint. So you can see that like, if you take some other point which isn't an opposite point to this one, then the probability that is assigned here doesn't have to be related to it in any way, right? It's only the pairs of opposite points. So for example, I could assign a half everywhere apart from uh, the North Pole and the South Pole where, where I assign one and zero. So then every pair of opposite points sums to one, including the one and zero, but this is definitely not a linear uh, map, right? And if you have the, the, the map is given by the Born rule, then that is linear um, on, the, on the ambient space that we're in, in the, in the block sphere. Okay, so there would be no, there's no density operator that recreates this map where you're a half everywhere and one and zero at, at these points. So maybe this is something you can try and convince yourself of <laughs> if you want to. And you can also come up with like many uh, fun examples, if you call that fun, um, uh, of these counter examples. So another one is like it assigns one to everything on like the northern hemisphere and it assigns zero to everything on the southern hemisphere. So then every pair of opposite points is one zero the whole way around. And you can also see that there's, there's no density operator that does that. Maybe that's easier to see because you know that for a density operator, like it can only assign one at like one point on this sphere, which is like, so if your density operator is psi psi, then it assigns one here, but it doesn't assign one anywhere else when you uh, use the Born rule. Okay, so dimension two uh, doesn't work. And we're very sad. Um, okay, so what can we do about that? Um, so we can instead, uh, we can replace our postulate M where we were thinking about projective measurements uh, by a postulate that I'll call GM for generalized measurement. Um, which, uh, so basically the postulate for POVMs so that a measurement uh, can be represented by a POVN instead of a projective measurement now. Um, so this is gonna look like, so we have measurement. So every measurement can be associated to some sequence of uh, effects or POVM elements, whichever uh, term you prefer. Um, so I'll call I call the space of effects. Oh, not that. E of H. So these are just um, the positive operators. Uh, that are also less than the identity. So this is backwards to normal, but <laughs> hopefully you still understand it. Um, so these are positive operators on H, which are between zero and the identity. And then for our general POVM, what we have is that the sum over J of these is equal to their identity on H. Um, so this is a discrete POVM, which has discrete outcomes, uh, the same as before. I'm only considering these discrete outcome cases because uh, they're enough to get the results that we want. Um, okay, so now uh, we can use our same what is a state logic as before uh, to think that a state should now be a map uh, mu on our space of effect to probabilities. And the, if we have some POVM, then the probability is sum to one that we assign to each of these outcomes. Um, yes. Okay, um, so then there's a, 
an extension of Gleason's theorem, which was proved by Bush. So I'm going to call it Bush's theorem. Very original. Um, move this up a bit. And it basically tells us um, so for any separable Hilbert space H, um, there, there exists, oh wait, how did I phrase it before? Okay, just like that. Then we have that mu uh, that satisfies this relationship of E is equal to, again, the trace of E rho. Uh, so this is good. This is what we wanted, right? Uh, so we basically have the same result as we did with Gleason's theorem, except now we uh, extended the domain of our maps to the uh, full effect space. Uh, and now, no matter which Hilbert space, so no matter which quantum system we're looking at, these things that we think should describe our states uh, all have a representation as a density operator, which uh, so then we can uh, regain uh, our original formulation of quantum theory. So like we had before, so now uh, instead of H, S, G, M and B, we can just have H, G, M uh, plus state, our definition of a state. Um, so now it's time for the next meme and I'm going to pick like this guy that's having like a party and he looks really happy and like he's smiling a lot. Uh, so imagine that in your heads. Um, okay, so I think I need to clean the boards now, which is not something I've done before. Uh, bear with me. Also, where is the thing? Oh, it's here. Okay, so while Nuria is like <laughs> helpfully erasing that for me. Um, so what, what we've shown so far is, uh, so if we're looking for some new axiomatization of quantum theory, um, it would be enough for us to get to the standard like measurement axiom. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and then it's kind of a very easy extra step to get to the states, right? So you can like concentrate on trying to derive like the measurement part and then the kind of the state part comes like for very little extra effort afterwards. This is amazing. <coughs> Um, so this is kind of the, the main thing you need to take away from what uh, Gleason's theorem is and then the extension by Bush to POVMs. And then <coughs> we can now uh, ask the question of, um, did we actually need all of the assumptions that we put into these two maps in order to get there, right? Or were they actually slightly stronger than um, what we required? Um, Wait, what time does this end? Sorry. So, in 15 minutes. Ooh. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll try. Um, okay. Um, so, so, we were considering all POVMs in the case of Bush, but what is true is you can actually get the same result by only considering three outcome POVMs. So this is kind of easy to show, so maybe I will just show that for you now. Um, 
So now we just assume uh, that, so if we have E1, E2, E3, uh, that's a two, uh, E3, uh, um, such that these sum to one, uh, they sum to the identity, sorry. No. Um, and then, so um, when I say three outcome, I mean three or fewer outcomes, so it could have two, or it could just be the identity. Um, and then we assume that mu of E1 plus mu of E2 plus mu of E3. So we assume that this equals one instead of having our uh, countable um, sequence of these effects that sum to one. Now we just assume it for three. Uh, also caveat, this is now for finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. Before we were uh, in general looking, it could be infinite dimensional. Now we'll uh, restrict to finite dimensional. Um, so, so we have that this is true for any E1, E2, E3. And then uh, also, um, this is true, so we can consider So uh, this would be a two outcome measurement if you had E1 as the first outcome and E2 plus E3 as the second outcome. Um, so then what we have found is, so there are these, there are these two uh, mu of E1s uh, on both sides, right? Uh, so if you put those to the other side, you find that this thing uh, is equal to this thing. This was badly drawn. Uh, but basically, so you're getting mu of E2 plus mu of E3 is equal to mu of E2 plus E3, right? So that, that follows from these two statements, right? Because uh, they're both equal to one minus mu of E1. Um, so this condition uh, is called being finitely additive. Uh, and what you can show is then this uh, uh, implies, so this would be by induction. So if you remember induction from high school, it's now the moment that induction comes in. Um, so if we have any uh, finite uh, sequence of these effects that sum to the identity, uh, we find that it's, it's this implies that it's additive on these as well. So for any POVM, get that these add to one, right? So we actually only needed to assume uh, that the probability sum to one on any three outcome P over M to show that they sum to one uh, for any N outcome P over M. Uh, and then in the case of finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, this, this condition, uh, Bush's theorem shows that this is enough to show that this mu has to be the Born rule with some density operator. So you get from the assumption of three outcomes all the way to the density operator. Um, and we can go even further with this reduction. And I won't go through uh, all the levels, um, but in the end, um, you can just consider um, the you can just consider some subset of measurements, which are called projective simulable measurements. Um, so maybe I don't have time to define what those are for you, but the idea is that imagine you can, um, you're in a lab and you can do only projective measurements, but then you can choose with some probability to do one projective measurement or to do another one. The thing that you perform in the end then will be equivalent to some POVM. 
but not every POVM can be uh, implemented like this by mixing together projective measurements. So this is a, a subset. Um, so what you can show in the end that there is some special subset of the projective simulable POVMs that have at mo most three outcomes and you can still prove Gleason's theorem from those. So you're kind of reducing and reducing the assumptions that you need to make in order to find the density operator formalism uh, again. Um, so I was just planning now to take you on a short tour of the other generalizations of Gleason's theorem that are known. Uh, so they are, they are in the notes. Um, and maybe I'll just uh, list a, a few of them for you. Um, so the, the first one that I've got is the unentangled Gleason's theorem. So uh, if your Hilbert space uh, is actually like the tensor product of multiple Hilbert spaces, Uh, and each one of these has dimension that is at least three. Um, then as a, a generalization to the original Gleason's theorem, where you just consider projectors, you can only look at the unentangled projectors. So that's the projectors uh, which project onto <laughs> a subspace which has a basis of product states. Uh, so basically only the unentangled part uh, of your measurement uh, set is necessary for Gleason's result to be uh, recovered. Um, so maybe, so there is also an extension for GPTs, general probabilistic theories that John was telling you about. So at this point, I was planning to draw a small picture of John like I did for the other guys, but uh, I think since I'm running out of time, drawing pictures of John is not maybe the best use of my time. Um, uh, and there the question is basically, if we had found that nature was described by some other GPT instead of quantum theory, would we have been able to perform the same process? Uh, and what you can find is that there are some there is some subset of GPTs where this would be the case and some where it wouldn't be the case. Um, and if you've looked into GPTs at all, uh, maybe you know something called the no restriction hypothesis. And this condition is related, but not exactly the same as the no restriction hypothesis. Uh, but if you haven't heard of that, like, don't worry so much. Um, so I think now I'll just skip to the, the final thing that I wanted to talk about. Uh, which is that Gleason's theorem implies the caution specker theorem, which uh, is a version of contextuality which David introduced to you, but he doesn't like, so he didn't talk about it very much. Um, so I'll just briefly go through this. Uh, oh, crap. Um, so the uh, the caution specker theorem. So I call it the KS theorem. Um, it basically tells you that there isn't what we call a deterministic non-contextual ontological model for quantum theory, uh, which uh, so. 
okay, maybe those uh, words make more sense to you from David's lecture, but what I'll just tell you is that for such a model, model what you would need is that there exist states that are ontic states and they um, deterministically tell you what the outcome of any measurement will be. And then uh, you uh, retrieve quantum theory by saying that you just don't actually know what the ontic state is, right? So then that's where the probabilistic nature comes back. So, um, so if your measurements uh, are given by, again, these sequences of projections, um, then your non-contextual ontic state would have to assign zeros and ones to all of these projections in a way that each projection, like, is no matter which measurement it appears in, it's always assigned a zero or a one, right? So that's the non-contextual part. So then, uh, so if this lambda is your ontic state, then it's going from our space of projections. Um, to the set zero one. Uh, so remember before um, our states for Gleason's theorem were going to the interval because they could assign probabilities, but now it's going to just zero or one uh, because it's supposed to be deterministic, this state. But the thing that you can see, um, oh yeah, and so because it only assigns one to one outcome in every measurement, you would have that lambda of pi one plus lambda of pi two plus dot 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 equals one. Okay, and if you remember our definition for of a state that was given by mu before, this is a, a sub case of that, right? So before the only difference was that it could go to any um, probability. Uh, this map, and now it just has to go to one and zero. So then, because uh, Gleason's theorem tells you that this map uh, has to be represented by a density operator, then there is there is no deterministic version of that, right? Like the density operator never assigns just zeros and ones to all these projections. So then, uh, basically, what you find um, is that the caution specker theorem, no, <laughs> that Gleason's theorem uh, implies <coughs> the caution specker theorem. Um, and for the same reasons that you can't prove Gleason's theorem uh, in dimension two, you can also find uh, a non-contextual ontological model uh, in the caution specker sense for uh, the 2D quantum system. Um, I think maybe that's the end of my time. Yes. <laughs> okay, so I will leave it there. Uh, thanks for listening. physical insight of why it doesn't work in 2D. I mean, you gave us like a mathematical proof, but mm -hmm. I have like an insight uh, why from 3D to 2D something is wrong. Um, so it's a mathematical result, so like it's kind of hard to come up with a, with a physical result. Um, but so they're just, the measurements that you can do in dimension two are like, uh, very limited, right? And there is very little relationship between them, right? When you're doing these projective measurements, like, I don't know. So this is more, still more of a mathematical uh, <laughs> discussion, but they're like really unrelated to each other. And there's no like, uh, so each projection only appears in one measurement, right? So like in dimension three, you can have an, uh, a projection which appears in like, infinitely many different measurements, but in dimension two, no, just the one. Um, so this isn't very physical, sorry, <laughs> um, but it's the best I've got. Is it possible to motivate why the measurements have this mathematical structure? 
Yeah, so I guess that is <laughs> something that people try to do. Um, and so, I mean, there are many different routes you can do go down. So I think uh, in more recent years, the kind of information theoretic postulates became more popular. So you can look at like Lucien Hardy's, uh, I think the paper is called Five Reasonable Axioms uh, and things like this. And then also within the GPT uh, literature, this was um, something that's looked at. So the GPT framework um, is based on some kind of operational principles. Um, and so I didn't really get onto it, but the Gleason's theorem for GPTs, you can kind of use that in place of some of those axioms. Um, but for, and, and that is one way to motivate the structure of measurements, uh, but not specifically the quantum ones. You need like extra axioms on top. Um, but yeah, I can uh, give you some references for the axiomatizations that exist. I don't think, well, in this field, I don't know if anyone is like super happy with the, <laughs> the ones that exist so far. Maybe the people that wrote them, so sorry, guys. <laughs> um, but uh, people are still looking in some sense. So this is something you could think about, um, but in the way that I presented it, it's kind of difficult, right? So you start with a, a state is a density operator, and then you want to look for the measurements on there, but you don't really have the same structure, right? Because you don't have these density operators like uh, summing to the identity or anything like that. But if you look in the GPT framework for the ways that you can derive it, there you can either start from states or from measurements yeah and you equivalently end up in the same place so maybe this is the the way to go if you want to start from states <laughs>